Church, if you have your Bibles, let's open to the book of Jude. We'll start in verse 8 this morning. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week. As you're turning there and as we uh, look at our uh, scripture for today, especially the, the opening here in uh, verse 8, I'm reminded of uh, a pattern within some of the, uh, the science fiction movies over the past 30 years or so, uh, really starting with, uh, I guess, The Matrix. Uh, there is this concept of, of individuals, uh, people, uh, being able to uh, live and in some instances uh, even escape into a type of dream world where uh, reality is not actually reality. Um, you see this in uh, movies like Inception and, and other uh, types of, of fiction like this. And uh, in these particular movies and the, the plot, it always seems to find its way to the fact that sometimes people will realize that what they are experiencing is not reality, uh, that they are escaping from uh, the, the real world and their real life, uh, but they don't really care uh, because the fiction and the falsehood is actually better than their real life. And so they have to make a decision as to whether they are going to continue in this uh, dreamland, so to speak, or if they're going to embrace the fact that sometimes life is difficult, life is tough, and that they have to push through in reality. To them, ignorance would be bliss. But the truth is, for those of us in Christ, ignorance is not bliss. There is a, uh, a clear source of guidance that we have when it comes to reality. That is the Holy Word of God, that is the Holy Scriptures that have been passed down uh, through the ages, and rather than uh, drifting off into what we wish was the case, uh, we are to embrace the, the order and the creation and the morality and the guide uh, that God has given us and has given all people even before the time of Abraham. You see, sometimes we would like to forget the calling that the Apostle Peter reminds us of when he says, you are a chosen race and a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness, out of the dream world, into his marvelous light. That we as Gentiles would be grafted into the family of God. We would be included in this holy nation and this royal priesthood. But sometimes we would rather be friends with the world and actually drift back into the darkness. Because that's where the people are. That's where our coworkers are. That's where a lot of our friends are. That might even be where our family is. Ignorant and blissful. This is not a problem that's new to us. It didn't just come into existence in the first century or the 21st century as we see. It's very much an issue in the first century with the early apostles and the early church. People would rather embrace false teachings if it meant that they got to experience an ignorant faith. A faith that did not consider the plan or the purpose of God, but instead suited their own desires and their own passions and their own opinions about life. Again, this is not just a 21st century problem. What we're going to look at today are five characteristics of an ignorant faith. These are described in the book of Jude, and we're going to pull them out of the scripture together in the hopes that we never find ourselves wishing to be pulled back into uh, a blissful ignorance, wishing that we could ignore the, the commands and the instruction and the guidance of God. But instead, we embrace the true teachings of Jesus Christ. So follow along with me as I read verses 8 through 13 this morning. And the Word of God says, Yet in like manner, and so he's thinking again on the people that we discussed last week, yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, 
reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. And so the subject will remain the same as the opening of Jude's letter. We are talking about false teachers, false doctrine, uh, these things that have slipped in, as, as he said in the opening of his, his letter, unnoticed. They have crept in unnoticed. And again, Jude's desire was to write an encouraging letter of faith, much in the same way that we enjoy hearing an encouraging sermon. The people of God who already believe the gospel, we still enjoy hearing the gospel. We still enjoy uh, hearing it preached to knowing the promises uh, that rest for us in Christ Jesus. But if we are to grow from the milk of infants to the solid food of mature adults, we need to address all of Scripture. And that was what Jude is doing here. Even though he would like to send the encouraging message of the gospel, he must ask us to contend for the faith. And he starts in verse 8 with a description that combines the actions of the previous verses with further description that is to come. And what he's discussing is God's authority, specifically that these false teachers reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. Now the glorious ones certainly indicate God. It certainly indicates the other heavenly bodies, the angels who deliver the word of God, and even the prophets who have delivered the word of God. A rejection of any of these is a rejection of God himself. And in rejecting God's authority, an ignorant faith rejects God's sovereignty. This is the first characteristic. It rejects God's control. It rejects the right of God. Listen to this. It rejects the right of God to order his own creation. To make the things that he has made however he wishes. They say we don't like something that God has done. So we're going to ignore it. There are some things that we can't ignore. Some of the order that God has set up. We can't ignore gravity for instance. We cannot ignore the way that our earth revolves around our sun. So instead they would look at the social order. The family order. The moral order that God has set up. And decide to reject his sovereignty in these matters. This is what Jude is talking about. Taking control of these things rather than humbly submitting to God's creation. When I was growing up, the house that we lived in, we had a, a large room, a large uh, game room that uh, me and my brothers were able to, uh, to play in. And we had a lot of stuff in there, but uh, two of the the things that were most popular uh, were any of the, the sports that we were playing at the time. We, we, we tried to transfer that indoors. So we had the, uh, some of you probably had the Nerf basketball goal that you put on the wall, you know, and then you have the, the, the ball. It bounces just a little bit, but it's, it's not nearly the size of a real basketball goal or a real basketball, but you could, you could play it inside. And so we, we had that hanging right there on the wall. And then we also liked to play uh, home run derby in the, in the room itself, and so we had these these little, very short plastic bats and a, another little Nerf ball, and you pitched it, and if you hit it and it hit the back wall, that was a home run, you know, and you, you saw who could who could get uh, who could get the most runs. But uh, when we were when we were coming up with these games, we were very careful to not have too many little rules. We, we made the rules as simple as possible. 
because if we, if we made um, you know, a lot of these uh, extra things that, that were required, we knew that we would end up cheating and that we would, we would break these rules. And so we made them as simple as possible. You know, you hit, you hit the ball, and if it hits the back wall, it's a home run. If it doesn't hit the back wall, it's not a home run. You know, you, you play on the goal, and if nobody's bleeding, it wasn't a foul, you know, type thing. And so we just made it as, as simple as possible. And the guy still cheated uh, as we were working. I, and, and worse than that, when we had friends who, who came over, uh, we, would, we would play these games, and they would offer their own advice about how to make this, this game better. Anybody ever, have, anybody ever do that? You, you, have, you have created this thing, and uh, you enjoy this thing, and uh, whatever it might be, but uh, somebody comes along, and they can make it better. You know, they can, they can give you some advice. They can give you some rules to, uh, to add in. But we would never let them do that because this was ours. You know, we, this was our room. This was our house. These were our, our uh, pieces of equipment. We have made this game. We have made these rules. And this is how it is. You can take it or leave it because it was something that we had created. And yet with, with the autonomy that we have, with the freedom that we have and the ability that we have, we forget that all of us are God's creation. That we are not free to do whatever we want to do. But instead we are still, I would say, morally bound to serve and to fulfill the will of our creator. The people who have crept into the church of the first century, they have denied this fact and instead held on tightly to their own freedom and their own autonomy and have said, even though I was created by a God, I am going to refuse the teachings and the will of this God and do whatever I would like to do. This is contrary to the full teaching of Scripture. The Apostle Paul describes our lives as a living sacrifice, not something that is that is killed and placed on an altar, but instead a living sacrifice every day. Peter describes us as living stones that God is building into a spiritual house. And so we have a lot of freedom, God-given freedom, that he has granted us. But we do not have the right to reject the sovereignty of the creator and the will and the way that he has set up for our lives and for everything that he has made. This is the first characteristic. Ignorant faith rejects God's sovereignty. The second is found in verses 9 through 11, and there's an interesting story here. I said uh, it's actually four interesting stories, but we'll start with uh, the most unfamiliar one, and this is Michael and Satan arguing over the body of Moses. It says in verse 9, but when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing over the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you. And so this story is considered an apoc apocryphal but traditional Jewish story that was obviously well known for the Jewish population of this time and before this time as well. Uh, an early church father named Origen stipulated in the third century that this came from a writing called the Assumption of Moses. However, in any of the parts of the manuscripts that we have of this that are hundreds of years older than the original would have been, this story does not appear in that writing at all. The only thing that we know for sure is that Moses died and was buried in an unknown place. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34 makes it clear that nobody knew the exact resting place of Moses. Here in verses 5 and 6 it says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. So in this, looking at verse 6 right there. He buried him in the valley in the land of Moab. Who is he? The tradition tells us that it was God. And it further tells us that God sent Michael, the archangel, the leader of God's forces, to do this. 
the method of burial is not as important as what the story says about the burial. So you go back to verse 9. It says, when the archangel Michael contending with the devil was disputing over the body of Moses, he did not presume, this is Michael, the archangel, did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebu rebuke Satan. The point is that even Michael, one of the most significant members of heaven, instead of using his power and his authority, he looked to Satan and said, the Lord rebuke you. I am doing what I am told. I am following the commands that I have been given. If you want to try and stop me, I am going to let God himself deal with you. He relied on God, and an ignorant faith does not. An ignorant faith relies on their own guidance instead of God's guidance. Relying on their own guidance is what got Satan in his situation in the first place. Michael wasn't going to make the same mistake is what this tradition tells us. But what about us? What about humanity? What about those of us who uh, do not live in heaven currently and have not seen the face of the Lord? Well, we have three examples here of human rebellion in this way against the guidance of God. Starting in uh, verse 10 where it says, But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. So we have three human examples from the Bible. Cain was unrighteous and jealous of his brother. He was the first example of someone who both despised God and humanity. He hated God's judgment and he hated his brother for following God's order. Balaam was a covetous, deceitful prophet who schemed in the name of the Lord against Israel and Moab. He's an example of greed and within the Jewish tradition is considered the antithesis of Abraham, the faithful servant of God. Korah was a family that had rebelled against Moses and Aaron. They rejected God's authority by rejecting the man that God had put in authority. To them, they were just going against Moses and Aaron and, and these two human beings. But this isn't, the, this isn't the way that God viewed this. God had set these guys up in, in this position of authority. And by them going against them, God viewed it as them rebelling against him as well. And so Korah's whole family along with 250 chiefs who followed him, God opened up the earth and it swallowed them whole for their disobedience. But until these judgments happened, they didn't see anything wrong with, with their attitude or, or what, they were, what, what they felt about authority. They were perfectly happy being in their fully autonomous dream worlds, not worrying about the, the guidance or the sovereignty of God. It should cause us to think about our own life. Where are we purposely ignorant in the order and the guidance of God? Is it in our work life? Are we not treating that as a mission field? Because that is what the Lord has called us to do. It might be in our home life. Are you not being the husband and the father that you're supposed to be? Does everyone else get the best of your time? This is against God's will as well. Have you rejected God's order on something culturally? We don't like the way the Bible speaks into an issue, so we choose to ignore it. All of these are not only sinful, they are dangerous for God's people and they are dangerous for society. As we look at these three examples, the one thing that is clear in all of them is that God was not blind to disobedience. He was not blind to Cain's jealousy. He was not blind to Balaam's greed. He was not blind to Korah's rejection of authority. 
And he will especially not be blind to those who influence others to turn their back on God. What follows in verses 12 through 13 are metaphorical descriptions of what these people look like. Let me read these verses again, and then we'll go through them together. He said, these, talking about these people, these are hidden reefs at your love feast, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves. They're waterless clouds swept along by the winds. They are fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead and uprooted. They're wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. They're wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Let me explain each of these, and then we will see how they fit into the the lives of these individuals. The hidden reefs at the love feast. The love feast is easy to understand. This is the Lord's Supper that the church would have uh, conducted. At this point in time, they would have conducted it at least weekly during their meetings, but they probably would have conducted it every single time that they met. Uh, this, this remembrance of what Christ had done for them. And so these hidden reefs, these obstacles that could not be seen, readily seen at first, but were causing problems for even the participation in communion. Waterless clouds swept along by the winds. These were clouds that brought the promise of rain, but instead passed on without a drop. These were the false teachers. Fruitless trees, twice dead and uprooted. At the time, there should have been a harvest in the autumn. All that is left is a, a barren fruit tree, nothing to show for the year of growing and cultivating. Wild waves or raging waves casting up the foam of their shame, reckless behavior that actually causes harm. It's not just a difference of opinion here. We actually have the teachings and the, uh, the actions that are causing harm to God's people. And lastly, wandering stars, probably referring to shooting stars, pieces that are seen for a moment and then are gone. They burn up. They're never seen again. These are metaphorical descriptions of what an ignorant faith looks like. And the first description shows that an ignorant faith offers false promises. This is the waterless cloud. They look like they are going to bring rain to the land. They promise goodness and growth, but they bring nothing. Uh, you golfers out there, uh, I've got a... a picture to show you. Throw that, throw that picture up. Um, y'all remember this beauty? This thing right here? The, the Nike Sasquatch driver? It was supposed to be uh, the answer. It was a square-faced driver. Uh, supposed to be the answer for curing your slice uh, because of how it was shaped. Um, it was so bad that they offered Tiger Woods like $50 million to use it and he wouldn't do it. Uh, it, it looks hideous, it sounds awful, and uh, I know at least one person in the church who still has this in their bag, and, and I'm, you may like this, but you're wrong. It's, it's, not, it's not a good piece of equipment, and I'm just worried that somebody's going to see us playing together and think that we know each other, and so... Please take it out of your bag. But there's, there's, always, there's always something in the world, in our life, that promises uh, to achieve something, but it can't deliver. And this is what Jude is saying about these, uh, these waterless clouds. Uh, there's a, a desperate need for rain, and, and the, the farmer sees it, and they think, finally, we're going to, the, the land is going to get some, some nourishment, but instead of of watering the fields, it just passes on along, and they have to wait for the next one. The false teachings and the, uh, the false teachers who come into the church, they, they make these promises of, what, uh, of who they are and, and how they represent God, but they, those promises are empty. They're false. And this is dangerous. This, again, is hurtful to society and hurtful to the church. The young adult Sunday school class, they're going through Galatians right now. In Galatians 1, 8, Paul says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary 
to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. There is only one gospel. There is only one word of God. There is only one set of promises that are true. And these promises are found in Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 1.20. Everything else is empty. They prove themselves to be empty. And they also prove themselves to be unrealized solutions. An ignorant faith offers unrealized solutions. Look at the, the hidden reefs of the love feast. They seem to be participating in communion. They seem to be following the scripture. But they add something to it. Or they take something away from it. Or they do something to change the, uh, the command, the guidance, the order that God has created. And to them, it might even seem small. It might seem like a little thing. We're just, we're just trying to, to adjust the guidance of God just a little bit to fit our culture and our people and our day and time. But these are the commands of God that are timeless and should not be changed. The Lord's table should not be changed. They thought that they were offering a solution, but instead they were creating an obstacle. Look at the fruitless trees. They promise to yield a harvest in autumn, but they are barren and fruitless and dead. Deuteronomy chapter 18 says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and you need not be afraid of him. You need not listen to him. Because his prediction, his prophecy in the name of the Lord did not come true. It is a false statement. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says this of fruit trees. He says, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the dis diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And I want to be, I want to be very clear. I, there, there's, not, there's not anything in the Bible where, where we, are, we are required to, to reach a certain level. We're required to, to memorize a certain number of passages of scriptures or a certain, uh, you know, we're required to, to, to do certain things in order to, to earn our way into heaven. That's not the gospel. It's not about what we've done. It's about what God has done. But again, there is, there's a clear indication here. There's throughout Scripture, Deuteronomy, as well as Matthew, that when we have an encounter with Jesus, a, a true encounter with Jesus, something will change about our life. We will not be the same person that we were. We will be transformed. This is an undeniable truth of Scripture. There will be spiritual growth in our life. There will be spiritual growth in the church as the, the gathered body of multiple believers worshiping God. We will not be dead. There will be life. There will be laughter. There will be work being done. And there will be solutions to problems. And these solutions will not be ours. They will, be, they will not be the best advice of human wisdom we will not run the church like we do in ordinary business. Too many churches have died because people treated them as small businesses rather than a divinely instituted thing. We have one authority, the Lord Jesus Christ, and one source of guidance, the Holy Bible, with one purpose to go to all people. This is the solution. This is the plan. This is the goal. It has to have this in mind. Our mission statement here at First Baptist Church says, First Baptist Church exists to glorify God by striving together for the growth of all believers for the purpose of going to all peoples. It's right there on the masthead in all of our materials, the bulletin, the website, everything. This is, this is who we are. This is what we are trying to do. This is what we are working towards. Not an ignorant faith that is characterized by waterless clouds and fruitless trees and unrealized solutions. 
but an active church that grows in the love of God, in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and works for the good of all people. And if we're not doing that, then any work that we do and any individual that we are, it will not last. This is the, the, the last characteristic that Jude gives. The dreamers from his opening portion here who don't wake up, they also don't last. An ignorant faith offers destructive and fleeting figureheads. We had a, a pastor's meeting here not long ago, and, it, and a lot of times it, when you have people from around town who come into our church and especially if they're uh, they're in the other building they walk past the um, the wall that has all the former pastors on it if, if you've never been back to the uh, the chapel area it's good. there's a wall with with the picture of all of our our former pastors on you really ought to take a look at it I mean one of them is the spitting image of Jay Leno I kid you not but um, but you know what I'm talking about yeah um, but as you look at that, one of the pastors said, is this the, is this the wall of fame or is this the wall of shame? Uh, you know, uh, talking about the, uh, the figureheads who have, who have shepherded this, this church. And the truth is, in, in, a, in a, a church like ours, you know, 180 plus years old, there's probably been a little bit of both. There's probably been good shepherds and there's probably been bad shepherds. There's probably been those who... who trusted in the Lord, prayerfully considered, studied up, and, and led into a, a time of prosperity. And there's probably been some who have, who have led into a time of destruction or, or have taken a step back from, from moving forward and reaching out to, to all peoples, sharing the love of Christ with all peoples. But here's the point. With the good and with the bad, the church is still standing because the church is built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. The, the destructive leaders, these, these fleeting figureheads, they're here and then they're gone. But the Lord remains. He helps, he guides, he counsels, he empowers us to do his work for his mission, not for our own, you know, the things that we want to, to have done, but for his mission and he invites us to be a part of it he gives us the opportunity to be a part of it when the church is strong the, the bad are like shooting stars they're here and then they're gone but the good the people not just the pastors the people relying on the guidance of the Holy Spirit trusting in the, the holy scriptures of God they recognize God's sovereignty. They don't offer empty promises because they don't make their own promises. They only promise what God has offered. And again, I think back to the, the opening of Jude's letter where he says that there is a, a need to protect the church. This is, this is why he's writing. And these are not, not my words. They're, they're Jude's. He's, he's asking for them to contend for the faith. Verse 3. Contend for the faith. Because there can be destruction when falsehoods and, and unsound doctrine begins to make its way into the church. And so we should all, this is not a job for the pastors or the deacons or anybody. This is all of us to contend for the faith. Understand what, what the gospel actually is. Understand what doctrine actually is and contend for it with grace, with mercy, with compassion in the same way that Christ did. But if we don't do this, we only have to look at the, the kings of Israel and Judah. Look at the division that false doctrine has caused in the global church today with the, the multiple denominations and the, the vast differences in doctrine and what they believe about God all over the world. It is destructive. But again, God's church is still standing because it is built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to focus on. And so as we close, we would ask the question, how is your faith today? Each and every one of us, are we confident in it? Or are we purposely being ignorant about certain things? Maybe we need to reintroduce ourselves to the Holy Word of God. Maybe we have been asleep for too long. I don't know what each situation is, but I do know that we cannot be ignorant 
in our faith. We can be confident. We can be bold and we can be thankful because God is good. He's gracious. He's wise. And he is merciful to us.